20 decimal places down. You don't like it 30 decimal places down? <laughs> it's all right. The trouble is that we cannot make a model of that, a real model. If we stop these things at some distance, then the theory that we write is in mathematically inconsistent. It gives probabilities that don't add up to 100%, or it gives negative energies, or it gives something silly. Of course, it gives these things with infinitesimal amounts, but it's not a self-consistent theory. Therefore, we don't know. We do have this difficulty with this theory. We don't know whether if we stop the theory temporarily, it makes sense, or if we just go taking what we call the limit here, where we use it, everything, and do the renormalization process, calculate everything in terms of the experimental mass, and then forget about the infinity, whether that's a mathematically sound thing. So I have to explain that in order to tell you the exact position of physics today. That's the problem. It turns out, in addition, there's the same kind of a problem about the speed. That also has a correction. If you were to have started out and imagine that two electrons were interacting via a photon, and they were the effective coupling C, zero, C zero. And now you have a, a correction because the photon that goes along can make a pair, and then that could annihilate and make another photon. And that corrects this, and so on. And in exactly the same way, the effective coupling constant, which is measured experimentally, I cheated a little bit. I said it was that. It isn't. It comes out like this, that the experimental coupling constant is equal to C0 square plus corrections of the order C4, because you have two Cs here and four Cs here times a correction. Yes, you guessed it. That's right. This correction is also infinite and causes the same nerve-wracking business. But this is measured experimentally. Make that zero, and it will come out okay, because zero times infinity is finite. Never mind all that. If we, if we put the results in terms of the experimental constant, then there's no difficulty, and all the infinities disappear. So in other words, we have to use the renormalization trick twice, once for the masses and once for the charges. Uh, once for charge, once for the coupling constant, which is called electric charge, and the other for the mass of the electron. Okay? And when we're finished, we get a coupling constant, which we have to look to experiment to measure. So that uh, is simply a technical difficulty, perhaps, and maybe a real difficulty. But anyway, that's the slightly discomforting condition in which the theory is. That's the second, the second, the first main problem. Now, with regard to questions about electrodynamics, after if you say, I accept that, that probably is okay, or if it isn't okay, I'll wait for some mathematician to find out for me. We then have the following interesting physical problems I mentioned before. Where does this number come from, from experiments? I know, but a good theory would have that this thing is equal to 1 over 2 times pi times the cube root of 3 times 6 and so on, so that you know what it was, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a number that has to be put in that nature has, or so to speak, if you're religious, you would say God has created that number. But we would like to try to figure out, if we can, a little clue as to how he thinks to make a number like this. For example, <laughs> maybe that, why isn't that a four there, you see? Okay. In the same way, uh, by the way, you might ask, in the same way, what is the mass? That is also a number. Yes, that's also a number. If you write the mass of the electron, and I'm always going to put the experimental masses down, it comes out a number. There's so and so many grams. And why is it that many grams? You first have to tell me why a gram is as big as it is. It's because somebody chose a gram, I think, during the French Revolution or something. They decided such and such is a gram, and then an electron is so many grams. That's uh, therefore not a real problem. But nevertheless, I'll put it down here as a problem. I'm not going to use grams because it's a, there's too many zeros. We have a particular unit which doesn't make any difference what it is, but we'll call it the million electron volts is the energy, masses and energies and equivalent that you get when you have a million volts and have one electron fall through that much distance in volts. And I, this mass is known many more decimal places, but I'm not going to bother you anymore with these long strings of numbers. So the mass of the electron is this, and of course we don't know why it's that particular number. That depends on why we chose the gram, the size of the order of electron, or the volt, the size it is. Okay. And that, uh, so that is not a, by itself a serious problem. But the reason I write it down is that it's going to turn out 
that there's a large number of pro particles in physics, not just electrons. There's, a, as I mentioned, several yeah. dozen. And they all have masses, and they're all different. And they're all the same problem. Where did this one get its mass? You know, they're all relative to it. You can't play games with the grams anymore. One's a ratio. For example, you find one is 67 times this one. Why? So this is, the masses are, in general, a problem. Which we do not, to which we do not know the answer. So we have no way to determine this mass. Now, that summarizes all of the problems associated with quantum electrodynamics. The most beautiful one is the coupling constant 137 point and so on. And all good theoretical physicists put that up on their wall and worry about it. There is, at the present time, no idea of any utility for guessing at that number. There have been from time to time suggestions, but uh, they didn't turn out to be useful. They would predict that the number was exactly 137 when it looked, well, the first idea was by Eddington. And experiments were very crude in those days. The number looked very close to 136. So he proved by pure logic that it had to be 136. <laughs> then it turned out that the experiment showed that that was a little wrong. It was near 137. So he found a slight error in your logic and proved with the <laughs> Pure logic, it had to be exactly the integer, 137. It's not the integer, it's 137.0360. Every once in a while, someone comes out and they find out that if they combine pi's and e's and 2's and 5's with the right powers and square roots, you can make that number. It seems to be a fact that's not fully appreciated by people who play with arithmetic, that you'd be surprised how many numbers you can make by playing with pi's and 2's and 5's and so on. <laughs> And if you haven't got anything to guide you except the answer, you can always make it come out even to several decimal places by suitable <laughs> jiggling about. It's surprising how close you can make an arbitrary number by playing around with nice numbers like pi. I mean, it's a, it, and therefore, throughout the history of physics, there's paper after paper of people who have noticed that certain specific combinations give answers which are very close in several decimal places to experiment, except that the next decimal place of experiment disagrees with it. So it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Those are the problems of quantum electrodynamics. Now the next part is the con connection of quantum electrodynamics to physics, to the rest of physics. And then we're going to have a good time now for the rest of the lecture because I'm going to tell you all about the rest of physics. And you can compare the laws of the rest of physics with the laws of quantum electrodynamics. But first I must say immediately that the rest of the laws of physics are not known as well as quantum electrodynamics, and therefore what I have to say is to a large, ex is to a varying degree, uh, uncertain. Uh, nowhere near as certain as the electrodynamics. So I, uh, first there must be a connection because uh, there have, we have to discuss one point, the photon, which couples to the electron, also couples to the nucleus. That's why the electron is attracted to the nucleus. So there's something inside the nucleus that couples with a photon. In other words, we sometimes say it's charged. To say a particle is charged or something is electrically charged is merely a statement that it couples to a photon, that photons are absorbed by it or emitted by it. That's what it means. Anyway, nuclear particles are charged. So we, in the beginning of the history of this thing, knowing about the nucleus and puddling around looking at them, it became pretty clear that it's easy to understand nuclei. Of, diff of atoms, that tiny little center where the electrons go around. They're different from atom to atom, and they could all be thought of as being made out of two particles, uh, a number, a number of particles of which, well, how do you say it in English? <laughs> a group of particles which are either protons or neutrons, like, uh, for instance, a particular carbon, for example, is a nucleus that has six protons and six neutrons in it. Nuclei can have, uranium has uh, 146 neutrons and 92 protons in it, and so on. Uh, hydrogen, the simplest nucleus, has just one proton in it, and so it goes. So out of protons and neutrons, the nuclei can be made. But the protons and neutrons that are in the nuclei stick together quite tightly. The forces are very much, very large. The energies that are released when you let them jiggle around are much greater in proportion as the atomic bomb is more effective than dynamite. Because the dynamite represents a rearrangement of the electron patterns, and the uh, atomic bomb represents a rearrangement of the proton-neutron pattern. And the relative energies are very large. 
the particles that interact, that we, well, when we tried to, in, at first, the first guess would be that the proton is simple also, and that the propagation of a proton, that we make diagrams for protons, same way, all we have to do is put the mass of a proton in here. Problem, first. It must be that there's more than just photons involved because the forces in nuclei are stronger than electrical forces by about 100 times. If we would invent some new force, we would have to have a kind of a t-square of the order 1 and not 137. Because the size of the forces needed are 100 times bigger than electric forces, we call those strong forces. Strong forces are those in which somewhere there's a constant of coupling closer to one than it is than electricity. I mean, it might be a quarter, it might be a fifth, it might be two, but it's not a hundred, not one percent. In investigating this, the, at the beginning it was hoped that the proton was simple, but the proton kept on showing that it wasn't simple at all. For example, there, well, there's many properties that indicate that it's not simple, and the neutron is not simple. For example, the proton, the electron we've talked many times has a magnetic moment which we can start expanding like this. But the proton has a magnetic moment 279, completely crazy. And the neutron, which is neutral and should have no magnetic moment, no magnetic interaction at all, if it were really neutral, is in fact has a magnetic interaction which is some number. Three, three. That indicating that inside the neutron there were some charges that could interact magnetically. It might be neutral, but there are plus and minus or something going around in there or something. So in study, to find out more about these particles, which look so much more complicated than the electron, we did many experiments bombarding protons onto nuclei and hitting them harder and harder, first to drive the parts out of the nucleus in order to see how the nuclei were constructed. But in the process, you discover going higher and higher energy that you created new particles. And the names of the new particles go, first they discovered pions, and then muons, and then lambdas, and kaons, and sigmas, and xeed, and they ran out of the alphabet. So pretty soon it was a sigma 1190, and a sigma 1386, and a lambda 11, and so on, because you just gave more numbers. And those numbers were the masses of the particles. And uh, ultimately, it is clear that there's an unending number of particles, there being about 400 and some odd particles at the present time, which is an a open-ended thing. It depends on how carefully you measure. And you can't go along with 400 some odd particles. Things get more and more complicated. And then it was realized that uh, these particles can all be understood, cannot all really be understood. We don't know because we, we're, now we're moving into a part of the unknown. We expect that they all can be understood as being made of others. Now, I would like to discuss these others, the so-called, the, the present guess as to the fundamental particle. Most of the things that are made by bombarding protons and so forth together are supposed to be made of quarks, and I'll tell you about those soon. Those are the strongly interacting particles. But in the process of the experiment, some new particles were discovered which were not strongly interacting with nuclei. The electron, for instance, does not strongly interact with the nucleus. It only interacts through the photon. It's a charge. It's a small thing. It's always got the C squared. There are other particles which do not interact strongly with nuclei. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide all the particles up into two classes, those which do not interact strongly and those which do. All right? The ones which do not interact strongly, they happen to be called by a horrible name.